Now let's get on to my message. Welcome to 2019, everybody. <clears throat> oh, you all are not excited about 2019 at all. I know, I know. I had the same feeling. At watch night service, how many of you were there at watch night in KL, City KL? When they revealed five, four, three, two, one, I shouted, no! The year of thrive is over. And I haven't yet started thriving. How can this be? And then they revealed new roads, new rivers. You all know that's our team, right? New roads, new rivers. Everybody say it together. New roads, new, roads. new rivers. And I kept telling myself, new roads, new rivers, new roads, new rivers. But how many of you, you don't need to put up your hand, but if you want to be honest, you can. How many of you feel that you're still on the same old road? Uh, or probably drinking from the same old river and it's already dried. But then, new roads, new rivers. Hi, yo, new year, 2019. But I've got good news for you. I said I got good news for you. I know you're not enthusiastic about it because every time I come up here, I say I got good news for you. What else is there for us to do? We are supposed to share the good news, not the bad news from here, right? So I've got good news for you. Before I go and get into the good news, I'll just share a little bit more. How many of you were here the last time I preached? Maybe in November, I think, or December? How many, November. How many of you remember what I preached? Huh. I prophesied about how we were in the labor room, remember? Yeah. Ah, for those of you who were asleep during that time, it's a good thing for you to go home and listen to the message. Called the labor room. Go and check it out on our, on our YouTube page, right? It's called the labor room. You need to listen to that message, okay? Then you'll get a clearer picture of what I'm about to say today. And if you're planning to fall asleep today, then after church, go home and listen to today's message as well. The last time I was here, I prophesied. I didn't just preach. I prophesied about the labor room, that some of us were in the labor room, that our breakthroughs were just around the corner. And since then, I've said the same message in KL, and since then, there were some people who got their breakthroughs. It was really just around the corner. But then there's another group of people who are still in the labor room. I'm one of them, both of us, me and my wife. We're still in the labor room. From the time I prophesied that message till today, we're still in the labor room, still pushing, still trying to push through, still laboring. I'm here to tell you, those of you who are still in the labor room, don't stop pushing. Remember I also mentioned that the devil cannot cause a miscarriage to your miracle. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. The devil cannot cause a miscarriage to your miracle. But you can stand in the way of your own miracle and abort it. Yeah. So don't abort your miracle. Keep pushing, keep believing. Your breakthrough is around the corner. I'll tell you why in a while. How many of you know that when you... How many parents here? Can I see your hands? Parents? Fairly good amount of parents, okay? Why you come up with this hand? No, no, parents, not want to be parent, parents. When, when you were dating parents, that's not dating, when you were married with your wife, without the kids, and then suddenly you found out you were pregnant, and then the kids came, it was a new thing, correct? It's not a trick question, it's a new thing. When you were a single person, from moving from a single person to dating, it's a new thing. From dating to being married is a new thing. Yes or no? Yes. And from being married to having kids, it's a new thing. So, what am I trying to say? You're in the labor room, check. You're laboring, check. But you're not expecting a new thing. You're expecting things to remain the same after your labor room experience. Let me tell you this. Things are not going to remain the same and we need to prepare for change. See, when you become parents, in the labor room, you're waiting for your seed, for your miracle, your baby, your breakthrough. When you become a parent, a parent, the whole game changes, right, parents, yeah? When you were married, I hope you were married first, but if you weren't, it's okay. If you were married, when you were married and without kids, you could date whenever you want. Date nights were every night. When we, were, when we first got married, any time when I come back from work, just feel like having a, going for a movie, it's a date night. Feel like eating pizza, it's a date night. Most, most of the time we go to a bar, a tall chair restaurant, not bar, and we have a tall glass of Coca-Cola and some chicken wings by the tall chair area. Because we were just married, there was just no extra responsibility. Suddenly Haley comes. How many of you know, date nights change now. 
It's a miracle to have a date night. You've got to plan years in advance. Years. Why I say years in advance? Because when they're 22, you can have your date night again. Finally. And you can't just go to any bar and have chicken wings anymore because she needs some soup or something that is not spicy. And you cannot just go to some, have some Coca-Cola because she's below 21. She cannot drink Coca-Cola. So everything changes. The game changes. Your whole situation, your schedule, your finances, your priorities, everything changes when you become a parent. Yes or no? Things do not remain the same when your baby is born. See, when, while we are waiting and we are pushing and while we are laboring in the labor room, we need to be ready for change. We need to embrace change. We need to be ready, just like a parent in the labor room, they are ready for the change. How, why, why, what, do I, what do I mean? What do parents to be, parents to be, huh? I mean, it's going to be parent. Huh? Parents to be, what do they do before the baby's due date? What are the typical things they do? The first thing we did when we found out we were pregnant, six months in, six months into the pregnancy, I bought this thing called the labor room bag. How many of you know what the labor room bag is, parents? That bag, you know, where you must have everything prepared at least three months before, she gives, before the due date. Why? Because when she goes, oh, there's no time for you to pack anything. You pack her, you take the bag, and you run straight to the hospital. You know what I'm talking about? The labor room bag where you put the change of clothes, the diapers, the guitar, the bottle of Coca-Cola. You know, because you don't know how many years you're going to be in the labor room. So, that's the first thing parents do. They prepare the labor room bag. What else they do? They get the confinement lady ready. Now, we, we were privileged. We didn't have to have a confinement lady. We had one mother and one mother-in-law, more than enough. Then some people go through the parenting classes, the baby 101 classes, how to breathe. <laughs> Husbands also learn to breathe. Because <laughs> you must be in rhythm or you get slapped. So, <laughs> baby knows he, uh, any, right? Yeah. <laughs> learn to breathe. And then what do we do? The most important thing, we prepare the room for the baby. If it's a boy blue, if it's a girl pink, for us, we like to be, uh, I love breaking tradition, so ours was red and black. And then, up the crib, you know, they'll have that, that toy which spins around with a creepy song so that the baby can fall asleep. I was a little bit different as well. Some would call it child abuse, but we had a samurai sword and a guitar. It was for our baby, our rocker baby that was coming. But you prepare the crib, you prepare the car seat, you prepare the baby bottles, you prepare the diapers, all before the baby is born. You even prepare the mother-in-law. Why you need a mother-in-law? Confinement food. Hello? But you can ask her, I cooked the confinement food for her. If my mother-in-law is listening, she also cooked. She cooked better than me. But you know the truth, huh? Have you ever encountered parents, parents-to-be, who go into the labor room having prepared nothing, not even bothered about the arrival of the child? What do you call them? Irresponsible. Never bought the baby's clothes. They expect to take the baby home naked from the hospital. They didn't even prepare the car seat, didn't prepare the crib, weren't bothered. Have you ever met parents like that? You would be borderline on child abuse, irresponsible. Yet, here we are, in the labor room. Didn't prepare the crib for the baby. Didn't, didn't childproof the house for the baby, your body. Did nothing in preparation for this baby that you're praying and laboring for, your breakthrough your miracle, and you're expecting a miracle. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Are you getting what I'm saying? See, church, in 2019, God is boldly saying He wants to do a new thing. Boldly. How I know God is boldly saying? Look at the back. New roads, new rivers. Now, that words didn't just come out out of nowhere. Pastor Joe and Pastor Ella weren't reading a magazine and they said, oh, what do we do for church next year? Huh, new words, new, new roads, new rivers. Sounds good. It rhymes. They're not rap stars. They weren't finding words to rhyme. Okay? This is God breathe. Okay? They spend time in prayer. They spend time in fasting. They're not just them, the pastoral committee, the whole church leadership before coming up with this. So it's something inspired by God. God is saying to you and I, 2019, He wants to do a new thing. Are you listening? 
turn behind and look. New roads, new rivers. That's not just mere words on your wall. Although the design may be just from PowerPoint. I'm sorry, designer, if you're here. I didn't, don't mean anything, but it looks like I, I got the same background from my thing last week I did. New roads, new rivers didn't just come from a PowerPoint slide. It came from heaven for you and for me. So God is boldly saying he wants to do a new thing. How many of you are ready for the new thing? Did you make your preparations for the new thing? There's only one, or two th one of two things that can happen in the labor room. Either you come out with a baby or without. And I told you the devil cannot steal your baby. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's no, no miscarriage for my miracle. Turn to your neighbor and say that. So the only way you come out without a baby, without your breakthrough, is if, if you abort it yourself. So you, God is willing, listen, God is willing that you come out of that labor room with your breakthrough. Can somebody say amen? amen? So I'm calling my message today, take five. Take five means to rest, means to take a break. The minute I say take five, take a break, everybody went, ah, we can sleep. No, no, I don't mean now, just listen first. Let's turn to the Bible, Isaiah 43, it was 14 to 21. You'll see the banner at the back there, Isaiah 43, verse 19 is our scripture for the year. But I'm going to read out the whole context of it. Ready? This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Israel here referring to God's people. How many God's people in the house can I see your hand? Some of you are not sure. Never mind. Maybe at the end of the service you'll be sure. Some of you are sleeping. It's okay. Maybe you can go home and listen and put up your hands at home. How many of you are God's people? Can I see your hands? This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sakes, for whose sakes? For our sakes. For our sakes, the Lord says, for your sakes, I will send an army against Babylon. Who's Babylon? Babylon represents your enemies. The, that giant that has been standing in front of you, that's blocking your breakthrough in 2018 and 2017 probably. That giant that's sitting right in front of you, that Babylon that's been flaunting its power and its strength over your life. God said, I will send, for your sakes, I will send an army against Babylon, forcing the Babylonians to flee in those ships they are proud of. How many of you know that your enemies will have to flee? The Bible says they come in one way, they will flee in seven because you belong to the Most High God. Most High, Most High God. Not one of the gods, Most High God. I am the Lord, your Holy One, your Creator and King. I am the Lord who opened the way, listen to this. I am the Lord who opened the way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called for the, called for the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots, and I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned. And then listen to verse 18. And then God says, Forget all that. What's he talking about? What, what rivers? I didn't go through any rivers. Egypt wasn't chasing me. Listen. Remember that situation that you were in? Where you had no way out and how God drew you out of that place? Do you remember? Listen, it wasn't coincidence. It wasn't luck. It wasn't the neighbor. It may, God may have used your neighbor, may have used your neighbor's dog to rescue you. But either way, it was God who made a way when you didn't have a way out. Remember, the Bible is saying, remember all that first? Remember? Remember that time when you were lost and God found you? He's saying, I did all that for you. It was me. It was me. I did it all for you. Now I'm telling you, forget all that. Why? It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. All that combined is nothing compared to what I'm about to do. That is how to get somebody excited in this place. Then it goes on to say, for I'm about to do what? Something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Let's pray. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence. We ask, God, that you will speak to us today, that you will reveal your word to us today. As we listen to plain English, you will reveal it in our hearts to our spirit that we will receive the word from heaven. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So we know now, we are in the labor room. 
We know now that God wants to do a new thing, and you want, He wants you to come out with your baby, with your breakthrough. We also know that we need to make the necessary preparation. We can't just go into the labor room not being prepared for what's to come. So what do we need to do? What do we need to prepare? I wish we could all just come forward later with nice music playing in the background, and we lay hands on each other, and we get our breakthroughs. How nice that would be. If that were true, I'll be laying hands on myself now, I'll get slain, I'll give my own offering, and I'll be, I'll be a jolly good fellow. I got my breakthrough. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Something you and I need to do to receive. Are you listening? See, we're expecting God to do a new thing, right? How many of you are expecting God to do a new thing? We're expecting God to do a new thing, but we want to remain the same. Not going to work. I say that again, not going to work. You want a new baby, but you refuse to change the way you live. Not going to work. We must be willing to change. We must be willing to stop some things and start some things. It's 2019. You are given the opportunity to start some things or stop some things. Change. If you sulk in 2018 during the message, stop sulking in 2019. Or at least change the way you sulk. If you sulk like that in 2018 when pastor is preaching, at least, at least sulk a different way in 2019. At least the least you could do is change something. Yeah. The first thing we need to do for preparation, number one, renew. Everybody say renew. renew. Now I'm going to step on some toes. Are your toes ready? Yeah. Put your toes out. Nice, nice, nice. I, I pray that you'll go home with bunker toes today so that you'll remember the message. Renew. Everybody say renew. I'm going to step on my own toes. Remember, I'm in the labor room, so I'm preaching to myself. Huh? What does it mean to renew? It means to give fresh life or strength to something. It means to renovate. Some of us need some major renovation in our life, in our life's choices, in the things that we do. Mark chapter 2, verse 22, it says this. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Listen to this. God will not pour out that new thing to you if you are old. Not in age, eh? if you remain the same. In other words, we need to be renewed. Why won't he pour out the miracle while you remain the same? Because both the miracle and the host will burst, will be destroyed. So in order for him to pour out this new wine that he wants to do, new roads, new rivers, he wants to pour it out into you, you and me, we need to be renewed. We cannot remain the same, or else we cannot receive what God is bringing. We need to enlarge our capacity. Amen? Amen. See, in the scripture above, in this scripture, the context of it is this. If you go home and read Mark chapter 2, it was the people were questioning Jesus. Why was it that at that certain time, the Pharisees and John the Baptist's disciples were fasting and doing their religious obligations, but Jesus' disciples were having their stakes. So they were really pissed off. They were angry. The Jews were angry. So they approached Jesus and said, what's wrong with your people? Your disciples are not observing the law. And so Jesus, Jesus answers them like this. What was Jesus trying to say? He was trying to explain to them that, look, the grace-filled life that his disciples were living in the presence of Jesus cannot fit into the legalistic ways of the Pharisees. What were some of the legalistic things the Pharisees did? They worshipped religiously. They had all kinds of rituals and practice and, and the way they served but they had no heart in it. They just did it out of a book. So Jesus was saying, trying to explain to them, we, the new wine, the grace that I want to pour out, cannot fit in those legalistic terms and conditions that you are, you are asking us to follow. What's that got to do with you and me? What's that got to do with you and me? Let's, let's try to have a new attitude in how we serve God in 2019. Sometimes we get so legalistic about things. Huh? And so, tida apa attitude. You know what's a tida apa attitude? Yeah. Lexadaisical, like, ah, whatever lah, you know. 
Oh, Alpha Course. Eh, uh, whatever. La. Your church is having an event. Eh, uh, whatever. La. Uh, we're having a fundraiser, eh, whatever lah. You bought your fundraiser ticket, eh, no lah. I'd rather go for a dinner, you know, because the dinner in the, in the fundraiser is not so good. The dinner in Pizza is better. Why I pay $200? Eh, whatever lah. Stop treating church in 2019. 2019, are you listening to me, church? Bring your toes, put your toes out nicely. Put nice, nice. Nice, nice. And I'm a big fellow, it's going to hurt. In 2019, stop treating church like an extra co-curricular activity. It is not. Listen, listen. This Jesus that you're serving is not this small tiki god that you got from Hawaii yeah. or from Fiji. He is the Lord of all or Lord or none at all. Yeah. He's either Lord of all or none at all. Yeah. So you decide in 2019 what, what 2020 you would like to have. Yeah. It's time we stop treating church like it's an extra curricular activity. Yeah. Stop giving excuses. Stop coming in late. Earlier in the, in the Chinese service, Pastor Edward was saying how the band and the worship team and those who at the back then who opened the church, they come in at 7 a.m. every, every Sunday or 7.30 to prepare. Listen, the, the songs, we've got four songs that we sing or three songs here. The first song is not the opening act. It's not for you to come in or because it's just the warm-up song. So the real worship only starts on number three. So you, some of you dragging your feet and coming in at the third song. Hey, 2019, let's do something different. You want a new baby? You want a new thing? Renew. Yeah. Stop doing things the same way in 2018 and complaining about the results in 2019. Yeah. You can't do the same things over and over again and expect a different result. That's madness. Yes. Madness. Okay? Stop falling asleep during the message. Yeah. There is a reason why we preach here. Okay? I, I would rather be at home right now listening to a good message from Mark Kelsey or somebody, some top-notch T.D. Jakes. I love T.D. Jakes. But I have been called to, I've been assigned to do something, to come up here and blabber something to you. Don't fall asleep. It's not doing me any good. It's not doing you any good. Yeah. It's not for you to fall asleep. It's not a time to relax and rest, even though I'm calling my message, take five. 2019, do something different. Yeah. Take down notes. Yeah. If you've never taken down notes before, take down notes. Do you know something? Let me show you something. And I tell this to the KL crowd as well. Auntie Mary. You all know who Auntie Mary is? Every time I'm here, I am so encouraged when I look at her because she takes down notes. I asked her once, I don't know if she remembers this, a long time ago I asked her, I said, Auntie Mary, why are you taking down notes? Because I need to change. Lah. Ah, come on. <laughs> Auntie Mary believes that she needs to change every day and she needs to grow. Some of you young fellas are sitting here, uh, why need to change? Ayo, Namela, own underwear so cannot change. God wants to do a new thing. Overall, church. Overall, we need to renew ourselves. Not just in church, outside. How are you in your workplace? Are you a trouble causer or a peacemaker? How are you in your school? How are you with your friends? Do you know how to handle your drinks? Do you know how to handle your drinks? Stop it. Don't go out and be a fool. Are you the kind of person where your friends' wives are telling them not to hang out with you because they're scared you are a bad influence? Change in 2019. Be a good influence. Be a peacemaker. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 to 16 says this. All of this is for your benefit. This is Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing, uh, talking to the church in Corinth, writing to the church in Corinth. Okay? And he's saying this. All this is for your benefit. As God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. This is why we never give up. He's talking about him and the disciples. This is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. So the things that I mentioned earlier, coming, stop coming late, change the way you sulk and all that stuff, is the physical things that we can change to renew ourselves. But ultimately, we need our spirit to be renewed daily. How do we get our spirit renewed? This is what Paul says. Paul was saying in the context of this, go home and read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, very good book to read. It's a very short thing, only 16 verses. Okay? Paul was saying, the disciples and him are faced with death every day. They are threatened to be thrown in jail every day. Troubles, they are knocked down, but they, never, they are not destroyed. They get whacked left, right, center, but they are still focused on delivering the good news. Why? For your benefit, he's saying. For the church benefit, for the people's benefit. 2019. 
Let's start doing things for other people's benefit. Okay? It's always, don't make things always about you. Always about me. Oh, yo, what time he'll finish, huh? The bakute shop will close, you know. We finish late. Hey, enough of you. 2019, let's think about somebody else. The Alpha course, not about you. You don't need to know Jesus twice. You know him already. It's for you to bring somebody. Do something for somebody else's benefit in 2019. Can, can you say amen? amen? And then Paul says this. He goes on to say this. If you want to be renewed, if you want your spirit to be renewed daily, don't stop serving. And don't stop sharing the good news. Pastor Edward was mentioning in the, in the Chinese service earlier. We need to share the good news. Not, oh, I have to preach the good news again to somebody. We're creating alpha course for you. So all you need to do is say, come to church. You don't even need to say anything else. Just, or not even say church, come to alpha. Or come for this course, whatever you want to call it. Okay? Come for this small group. That's all you need to do. The church is creating avenues, all the events that we have. It's avenues for you to share the good news. We need to stop, not stop sharing the good news. As long as we stop sharing the good news, it's like this. Someone, one day I had a revelation of what it means to share the good news to my friends or to invite people to church. This is, this is the re revelation I got. Imagine a fireplace, right? And uh, you need wood, right? Firewood in order for the fire to keep on burning. <coughs> What's wrong with my wife? The demon, Noel's demon. <laughs> you need firewood to keep the fire burning. Now, if you run out of firewood, eventually the fire in the fireplace is going to die. In order to start it back again, you need to put in more firewood. What's this firewood? Your non-Christian friend. I'm not saying you sacrifice them. <laughs> I'm saying spiritually, when you take somebody from death to life, from darkness to light, you're taking their baggage and chucking it into the fire so they can live a renewed life. That keeps your fire going for your benefit. So don't stop sharing the good news. That's how we get renewed daily. So number one, what was number one? Renew. Everybody say renew. renew. Secondly, embark. Everybody say embark. embark. Now you can put your toes in again. This is teaching time. Isaiah 43 verse 19b, the second part. God says, I will make a pathway, this is the one we read earlier, the whole scripture. I will make a pathway through the wilderness, through the wilderness, through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Can we have the picture of the first wilderness? When you're in the wilderness, when you're in the desert, you just say you're right here. Do you know where you need to go to go out of this desert? Do you need to turn left? You can have a compass. It won't help you, Jack. You can have Waze. He'll ask you to dive into a, one of those and die there. Waze will tell you, turn left and die. You can't go anywhere. You have no direction whatsoever. It's the wilderness. You're lost. You're stuck. You can't turn left. You can't go behind. You can't go forward. Either way, it's just you probably end up going around in circles and then you die. But God says this, I will create a path through the wilderness. Next picture. A path through the wilderness. Now with this, the road is long. The valley is deep. Was it the valley is deep? The ocean? But God. See, a song all coming into play. There is a pathway. With a pathway, now there is what? Direction. You know now where to go. The road is still long, but at least you know if you keep going, you're going to end up on the other side. You're going to come out of your wilderness. That's what God's saying. He didn't say that he will take the wilderness away. That's what we often pray. Lord, take the wilderness away. Give me good, new rivers, new roads. But we don't want the wilderness. The thing is this. God is not going to take away the wilderness. He said, I will make a pathway through the wilderness. He is also not going to put you in a stroller and push you through the wilderness. He didn't create lazy bums. He created a path for you to walk. You and I need to embark on the journey to get to the other side. He's already provided, he will provide the path for you. 
But you and I need to embark on that journey to get out to the other side. If we don't, if we sit on our lazy bums and wait and pray and pray and fast and pray and pray and come out and ask the pastor to lay hands, lay legs on you, nothing's going to change. You're going to end up dying in the wilderness. That's the truth. You will die in the wilderness. So it's up to you to get up and embark on that journey. Amen? But the second part, this is the best part. I love this about God. Because this doesn't sound so nice, right? Does it look nice to go on this journey? I hate driving also to Penang. And Penang is beautiful. I just love going to Penang, but I hate driving there. It feels like it's a wilderness. Imagine walking on this road. Oh my goodness, it doesn't look very appetizing. This is what God does. He said, I will make a pathway through the wilderness. And then he says, I will create rivers. Not singular, plural. I will create rivers. What does that mean? See, in the early days, when cities were being formed, you are listening? In the early days, when cities were being formed, cities were erected in, beside rivers. Why? Because rivers were a source of life. Are you hearing me? Rivers are a source of life. What, what else can you get from a river? The river provides food. The river provides water. Now, when I say river, please don't think of Klang River because none of this apply. There is no food. There's no water. It's only crocodile and dinosaurs. Don't go to Klang River and say, the Lord, new rivers, new roads, you'll die. You will die. That's a wilderness. Have you seen the color? It's a wilderness. It's not a river. Don't go to Klang River. Think of river as, in, as a nice stream, you know, beautiful, got fishers, not crocodiles. Okay, river. River provides food, provides water. The river also refreshes you. The river is also a channel for trade, meaning your economy can continue to, to increase. It's also a place of fun. Those of you who swam in the river when you were young and didn't get killed by crocodiles, it was fun. Especially in, in Sarawak, don't swim in the rivers. Even a small river like that has a big crocodile. That crocodile has been living there for years. It ate three villages already. Three villages, not three people, three whole villages. And you still want to swim there. Remember we went to Sarawak? Once we went to Sarawak with Bevin and Annie, and uh, we met this one of our friend's uncle, and his kids are jumping. He said, let's go to the stream. I'm thinking stream. Oh, must be beautiful. You know, blue water. You know, I can maybe pet a platypus or something. I don't know. And then we go to this drain. It's a drain. And children are jumping in a grass, jungle. Hey, I asked him, uncle, no crocodile here. Of course, God. And your children... Don't go to Sarawak rivers, people. <laughs> what is wrong? They're feeding the crocodiles with their kids. What am I trying to say about the river? God will give you rivers. While you're walking on this path through the wilderness, He will create rivers. In other words, you will not have to survive through the wilderness. You can thrive through the wilderness. It means you will never run out of life, food, or water. It means that you will have channels of trade. It means you will still receive your financial breakthroughs and your blessings and all kinds of things will still be coming good things while you're still in the wilderness. Isn't that a good God? You don't need to suffer the heat of the sun. Think of the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. God provided shade for them when it was hot and fire for them when it was cold. God gave them food and drink. They never ran dry. Amen. It's only when they decided to stop moving, they died in the wilderness. It means you can also be refreshed. See, we are, we are sitting in the middle of the wilderness, hoping that God will put us on a wheelchair and take us through. But the whole idea for the wilderness is for us to embark on the journey. So number one was renew, number two was embark. Number three, see, everybody says see. Isaiah 43, 19, the first part. He says, behold, I'm about to do a new thing. And then he goes on to say, see, I have already begun. Do you not see? it? See, uh, let's go back to parents-to-be again. When you're a parent-to-be, before your baby arrives, you already see your baby. What am I talking about? Not through the mammogram thing. You already see. What do you do? Is it mammogram? No. Ultrasound, what is mammogram? For, for breast cancer. Are you wrong words? Bad words I'm saying. Gee, I am not biologically created. I didn't study biology. I don't know. Or it's medicine. I so horrible. So, 
when you're going to be a baby, do you, what do parents typically do? They buy their clothes for the baby before the baby is born, right? When we found out that she was pregnant with Haley, the first day, we, no, the, the day we found out the, the gender of the baby, we found out it was going to be a girl. That day we went shopping. We didn't have much, but we were excited. I bought a, I bought a jacket and a skirt for her that on, she only started wearing at five years old. That's how big I bought it. And it's still loose. Because I didn't know she was going to come out this small. She was literally this small. Like, from here to here. I, I mean, I saw her, oh, yo, this is not going to fit, la. I thought a full-grown lady is going to come out. I didn't, just didn't, didn't imagine. But, but I saw the day that they announced that, we, we announced that uh, Sam was pregnant. I already saw my baby before she even arrives. I didn't know how she would look, but I knew she was coming. We need to see our miracle before it even comes. Are you hearing me? And then what I did, I prepared the budget, I planned the schedules, and I bought the clothes. And some parents have a, bad, a different... Uh, I only started to see the baby, actually, not on the first day that she was pregnant, because I was still in shock. I only got to be calm when we found out the sex of the baby. But most parents are excited on the first ultrasound itself. When, you, when, they, when, when they showed me the ultrasound, Haley was this small. I still don't see it. La. She told me it's this small. I still don't understand the, the picture. Most men can't see it. It's like staring into a 3D picture. You know, you just... You just can never see it. And the only thing I saw, honest, honest, the only thing I saw at that time was a tall glass of Coca-Cola and a big steak. Not in celebration, no, no. In the Last Supper. I was thinking, and then I saw a very, very empty wallet. That's honest to you. But after that, I saw my baby. And then he goes on to say this. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Everybody knows the scripture. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. What's God trying to say? What God has in store for you supersedes what you've already seen. See, when I saw Haley before she was born, I had an expectation of Haley already. But on the day she arrived, she was beyond what I saw. She's far superseded what I saw, what I expected. The fulfillment that I received was far more than I could ever imagine. That's what God will do to you. God wants to supersede your imagination and your seeing and your hearing. But how can He supersede what if you've never seen? What is He going to supersede if you have not seen? Therefore, you and I, before, we, before the arrival of our baby, before the arrival of our breakthrough, we already need to see. Are you hearing me? So number one, what was it? Renew. Number two, embark. Number three, see. My final point, number four, trust. Everybody say trust. Trust is defined like this. A firm belief, firm belief in the reliability, truth, and ability of someone or something. A firm belief. Trust and faith are two different things. Huh? Trust is a firm belief in the ability and the reliability of God. That means you can lean on Him. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 6, everybody knows this scripture. You can recite it with your eyes closed. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. But I like to read it from this version, the NLT. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. I'll tell you why, church. If you depend on your own understanding, you will die. Because it will not make sense. It does not make sense. Whatever I'm telling you today, if you put it in your own understanding, it does not make sense. The spreadsheets won't add up. The accounts will not tally. That is why we cannot rely on, on our own understanding when we are waiting for a miracle from God. We are waiting for, how many of you are waiting for a breakthrough from God? Can I see your hands? We cannot rely on our own understanding. We need to trust in the Lord with all, all our heart. Seek His will in all you do. All you do. Acknowledge Him in all you do. Not just in church, 
in all you do, in your business trades, in how you treat your employees if you're a business person, how you treat your boss if you're an employee, how you treat your fellow students if you're in school, everything you do, acknowledge him in all your ways. Then, then he will show you which path to take. We read just now that he'll make a path through the wilderness. You're waiting for him to create. This is the key. Then he will create the path. The band can come up. So number one, what did I say? Number one, we need to renew ourselves because God cannot pour out a new thing into an old container. Are you listening? God cannot pour out a new thing into an old container. Pay attention here. Don't worry about the band. They know what to do. Number two, first renew. Number two, what? Embark. Embark on that journey. We cannot wait for the wilderness. The wilderness is not going to go away and God not going to push your lazy bum across. We need to get up and walk through the wilderness. Number three, see. Start seeing. This is a faith thing. Start seeing before you even receive it. Number four, trust. Lean on God. What does that spell out? For those of you who have been paying attention and taking out notes. Rest. Everybody say rest. 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 Say rest again. Rest. rest. Oh, I need rest. Like really, I'm really tired. <laughs> rest. That's why the title of my message today, Take Five. Rest. What does it mean to rest in God? Does it mean you remain idle? Surrender everything? Oh, rest. Oh, just lie down in your small underwear. I'm resting in the Lord. What does it mean to rest in the Lord? Matthew 11 verse 28 says this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. How many of you are weary and burdened? Can I see your hand? Your Lord, your God, your Father wants to give you rest. I want to read to you something, a quote from Pastor Joseph Prince. This quote, don't put it up first. This quote, because then you start reading it. <laughs> I posted it, somebody posted it on Facebook like six years ago. And on my Facebook memory, it showed up about a few days ago. Of all the things in the world, I hardly go on Facebook, but when I went, I saw this quote. And it was in line with what I was going to preach. I didn't prepare my message yet at that time, but then at the end of the day, when I prepared my message, it was perfect for everything that I was going to say. So I want you to read this quote. I'll read it to you. Don't need to look at the screen. I'll read it to you, but you can put it up. This is from Pastor Joseph Prince, Senior Pastor of New Creation Church in Singapore. He said this, when you worry, listen, huh? when you worry, you are actually believing that the devil has power to make inroads into your life that God cannot protect you from. Are you listening? Yeah. That's what actually happens when you worry. You're believing that the devil has ability to attack you and God cannot protect you from him. Then he's going to say this. Goes on to say this. But when you refuse to worry, you're putting your faith in God. You have more confidence in His love and His power working for you rather than the devil's ability to harm you. That's what happens when you don't worry. When you refuse to worry but choose to rest, everybody say rest. rest. When you refuse to worry but choose to rest in the finished work of Christ, you will see, you will see the manifestation of your blessing. You will see your miracle. You want to see your baby? You want to see your miracle at the end of your labor room experience? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Stop worrying. Let me tell you this. I am a great warrior. Not a warrior, a warrior. I worry like there's no tomorrow. And I tell you in 2018, I worried about our business, about our finances, about the church. I worried, worried, worried about everything. And let me tell you, what have I achieved in 2018 through worrying? Nothing. In fact, I became tired of worrying. Let me tell you this, from experience, worrying does nothing for you. It just kills you faster. Gets you in a bad mood, gets you grumpy, gets your wife grumpy. I don't know how it works, but it works. 
do not worry in 2019. Worry is a matter of the mind. So whenever you sit to worry, you know, everybody has this chair at home, every man at least, a chair at home where it's the worry chair. When you sit there, it's for you to sit down oh, and worry. Take the chair and throw it out. No worrying in 2019. It's a matter of the mind. When worry comes, switch it with the word of God. Switch it with something else. Remember the waters that he brought you through. Remember the armies that he destroyed for your sakes. When worry comes, remember the Lord and trust in him. Let's stand. May 2019 be a year of rest for you and I as God creates the rivers and the roads for us, new path, new rivers, new roads. Now, how many of you are excited for 2019? Can I see your hands? Those who are excited for 2019. Thank you, Lord. If you're still not excited, I don't know, I'm out of breath. I cannot do I cannot. Just go home, listen to the message twice. Let's sing this song from the start. The reason why I chose this song again, And But God, is because it really helps us to tell God what we feel. Amen. Sometimes you need songs, sometimes words just, I don't know. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but when I sit before God, sounds like I got a lot of words to say. But when I sit before God, blah. So sometimes all you can do is say, whoa, whoa. That's all you can do because you've got no other words to say. And that's all you need to do sometimes. Just whoa in front of God. Songs like this help us to express what we need. Helps us to see our miracle. Helps us to apply our faith. So let's sing this song from the start. I give